Welcome back to Sono Stuff. It has been a long time since I recorded any type of episode. And the reason is because I've been working on a very exciting project with some of my great colleagues, specifically a resource for all you global practitioners out there that is you that are using ultrasound in low or limited resource settings. When I started working in limited resource settings, I just couldn't find a good resource that demonstrated the pathologies of ultrasound that I was seeing every day. So we endeavored to make an open access online text that can be accessed anywhere in the world. All the images and videos can be downloaded and it really highlights these tropical diseases, infectious diseases that you'll see in the limited resource setting. This project is long in the making and I really wanna thank my co-editors and all the authors that contributed. In addition, this is in, in electronic resources so we can continue to add to this text and so if you have great uh, cases or great images that you want to share, please get in touch with me. And we want to translate this text to all languages that we can. So if you have skills with language and medicine, we can use your help to make this resource truly available across the world. There's a link for the book at the beginning and end of this uh, podcast. Please share it widely. Over the next few months, I'll be showcasing the content of the book. So let's start with a case from Drs. Wahomey and Mersh out of Emberara University of Science and Technology and University of Buffalo. These are all real cases. So you'll see how people actually manage these patients in limited resource settings. So to start off, this patient is a 61-year-old male presents for difficulty breathing. His current illness began with a low-grade non-productive cough associated with mild chest pain, night sweats, and significant weight loss over the past two months. Initially, he was being managed as an outpatient for presumed pulmonary edema in the setting of renal failure. His symptoms progressed to difficulty breathing with tachypnea, palpitations, and fatigability over the past three days. His dialysis frequency was increased from two times per week to three times per week, but his symptoms worsened. He has a five-year history of HIV, but stopped using antiretroviral therapy for the past two years, ever since being diagnosed with diabetes. He notes good adherence with his diabetic medications. He has combined HIV-associated diabetic nephropathy with end-stage renal failure, currently on dialysis. Physical exam is notable for the vital signs here. Patients hypotensive, little tachycardic, and tachypnic is requiring oxygen, five liters nasal cannula and temperature is notably a bit hypothermic. Generally severely pale with anasarca, no jaundice, lymphadenopathy, he has distended neck veins and raised jugular venous pressure, cold peripheries, cap refills greater than three seconds, uh, respiratory is use of accessory muscles for breathing, the trachea central, reduced chest expansion on the right side, and stony dull percussions noted in the bilateral lower zones, reduced breath sounds in lower zones markedly on the right side. Abdominal distension was noted, non-tender, positive shifting dullness, and fluid thrill. The skin has scattered bruising, petechiae, and ecchymosis. In addition to point of care ultrasound, these were the imaging laboratory diagnostic tests that were available at the time. So random blood sugar is 13.8 mm millimeters per liter, or 248 milligrams per deciliter. Complete blood count uh, was notable for a normal white count, uh, normal, normal acidic, normal chromic anemia and thrombocytopenia. Renal function testing showed normal electrolytes. The creatinine was three milligrams per deciliter and BUN was quite high at 187. Chest x-ray was obtained and showed cardiomegaly and bilateral pleural effusions. Of note, this was the differential diagnosis of the practitioner taking care of the patient at the time prior to the point of care ultrasound. Now let's review the ultrasounds. The first video clip is a sub xiphoid view of the heart demonstrating a large circumferential pericardial effusion. Eccentric left ventricular hypertrophy, normal left ventricular ejection fraction, and a pleural effusion noted posteriorly to the descending aorta. There is a fibrous strand at the 10 o'clock position within the pericardial effusion concerning for tuberculosis pericarditis. Within the right ventri ventricular uh, region, there appears to be a tricuspid valve vegetation and or thrombus. On the second video clip, we have a sub xiphoid view of the heart with improved visualization of a large circumferential pericardial effusion, demonstrating multiple fibrous strands. There's also intra-abdominal free fluid noted at the anterior portion of the image. The third video clip is a fanning clip through the sub xiphoid cardiac window. Better demonstrates the complexity of this pericardial fluid collection with multiple fibrous strands. 
Clip number four is a peristeral short view of the heart, demonstrating a large circumferential pericardial effusion with fibrous strands. A posterior pleural effusion is also visualized. The left ventricular cavity volume is low, and there is intermittent interventricular deviations of the septum concerning for elevated right ventricular pressures. In the fifth video clip, we have an apical four-chamber view of the heart demonstrating large circumferential pericardial effusion with fibrous strands. Within the right ventricle, there appears to be a tricuspid valve abnormality or vegetation. The sixth clip is a right upper quadrant view of the abdomen and lower thorax, dem demonstrating a large pleural effusion and positive spine sign. The final clip is the left upper quadrant of the abdomen and lower thorax, demonstrating a large pleural effusion, positive spine sign, and a small amount of free intra-abdominal fluid. And here was the author's refined differential diagnosis after the point of care ultrasound. And this is a real case, so this is what really happened with the patient. They received bilateral tube thoracostomies, which drained greater than three liters of bloody tinged fluid. Fluid was taken for cytology, microscopy, and gene expert with centrifuge, which is a test for tuberculosis. A sputum sample was collected to supplement the pleural aspirate. Urgent dialysis was done while simultaneously receiving blood transfusions. Gene expert was positive for tuberculosis while sputum was negative. The patient was started on anti-tuberculosis medications, underwent dialysis three times per week for a month, as well as daily thoracentesis for three days. His pleural effusion is clear, dialysis and diuresis helped reduce the patient's symptoms, but a pericardiocentesis was never performed. Antiretroviral therapy was started after three weeks. One month into the hospital stay, the patient developed a nosocomial pneumonia, deteriorated and died within 24 hours. Interested, there is a discussion for each case. You have to go to the website though to read about it and learn more about each disease process. It's a sad end to a very common case in settings like these, and I'm hoping that cases like these can inform future care for these patients. Thanks for joining me and thank you for sharing this resource and we'll see you next time.